Hi, everyone, and welcome. You've tuned in today to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Barb Mitchell, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These virtual roundtables, of course, lead up to our in-person on-site CEO roundtables at our C-level networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Of course, we just finished one last week in Los Angeles, which was fantastic. And our next one is just around the corner in New York City, May 14th and 15th. If you are interested and would like any more information, you can go to thetelecomexchange.com. One more quick note for our on-demand audience. We love your questions and the panelists would love to answer them. Please feel free to go ahead and, and email them to uh, PR at jsa.net. We'll make sure they get to the panelists and get your questions answered. So we're going to get started. Today's topic is women in tech, trends in tech and telecom across Canada. And today we're talking to some top leaders in the Canadian tech and telecom industry about the latest trends that we're seeing across Canada. And in particular, we'll discuss how influential women are actively shaping the landscape around them. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our executive lineup from some truly breakthrough organizations across Canada. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jamie Leverton, the VP and GM for Canada and APAC, Kojiko Pier One. Angela Adam, the Marketing Director for East Structure Data Centers, located in Montreal, but uh, with facilities across Canada. Vivian Chan, COO of iExpo Technology Corp. And of course, Erin Athene, our Managing Director of Purpose 5. Ladies, welcome. We thought we'd start the panel uh, with the first question, giving you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your organization, uh, but really allowing you to offer some perspective on what developments and trends you're seeing in the Canadian marketplace, specifically as it relates to your organization. So, uh, Vivian, if you wouldn't mind taking that first question, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in terms of trends and developments, I, I have to say it's such an exciting time to, to be in Canada right now because I think there's been so much work done over the last 20 years in building a reputation in emerging technology. Um, having worked at Simon Fraser University uh, for a tenure, there are a number of ecosystems where we're globally known for. Um, these would include big data, quantum computing, uh, AR, VR, um, verticals like clean health, uh, uh, clean tech and, and health tech. Um, and, you know, back east, I would say AI. You know, Jeffrey Hinton from UOT started. Uh, he's the godfather of, of AI. And so these clusters of expertise are now really creating immense opportunity um, in Canada and globally. And so what's happening is these technologies don't work in isolation. Uh, iExpo Technology is a digital transformation company. What we do is we enable marketers to go from a 2D to 3D interface. We're building software that enables you to build 360 panoramic environments, 3D interactive imaging, creating sort of a sense of a, a new UI. And so that's what we do. But it's so funny, a lot of times folks will say, oh, you're, so you're a VR company. And I, I often have to correct folks and I say, no, we're, uh, VR is just one of the modalities of, of what we offer. But really we are an AI company, a big data company, and a VR company, an immersive technology company at that. And I just think that uh, for companies to stay competitive, you be, need to be able to, to um, integrate all of that together. And, and Canada is an, a tremendous place to be able to do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's that's what I'm excited about right now. Amazing. Thank you. Jamie, do you want to uh, jump in there with your perspective? Absolutely. Um, I, I really echo Vivian's comments about Canada kind of coming into its own with respect to um, some swagger around how innovative we are. Uh, we've got clusters, uh, as, Viv as Vivian mentioned, across the country. Um, and we're really seeing tons of focus um, in these in these areas of innovation. We've got great support from our government that helps to uh, 
to to really foster and invest in in this movement in Canada. You see people coming from all over the world to participate uh, in some of our hubs, which is which is absolutely fantastic. And for companies like ours at Kojiko Pier One, where we're Canadian owned and operated company, but we're we're global, so we have data centers and network across. Uh, across the globe, uh, and we offer hybrid managed solutions to our customers. We've got a, a deep history in emerging technology, a strong focus in in gaming, AI now, um, and and the other uh, the other technologies that uh, the Vivian mentioned. And really, what what we're so excited about is all all of the work that's happening in Canada, um, we can help our customers, whether they're in, in emerging industries themselves or trying to take advantage of these new technologies as more traditional enterprises, um, really take advantage of, uh, of how to access them, how to capitalize on them, and how to, how to do that on a global scale, which is unique for a Canadian tech company such as ourselves. So we're really proud to be Canadian and really, really excited to be able to participate in all of the innovation that's happening across the country. Amazing, thank you. And Angela, I know that at eStructure, obviously you support uh, and partner with uh, folks in a lot of these uh, breakthrough industries. Uh, would you mind talking about that? Um, I just wanted to build on what Jamie and Vivian uh, were saying um, to point out that today's technologies such as machine learning and AI and virtual assistants, uh, the IoT, they all drive and they accelerate the expansion of data centers. Um, and coupling that with the trend that we see in companies investing less and less in on-premise infrastructure and moving towards multi-tenant sites uh, such as ours, we clearly see a, a significant significant amount of uh, opportunity there. Um, moreover, uh, IoT apps uh, and, and gaming and VR and AR, like Vivian mentioned, uh, they all rely on what we say um, edge, data, uh, edge data and edge computing, um, which in turn opens the possibility for edge data centers. Um, and the way we envision ourselves and we position is to be the, oper the infrastructure operator of choice for these innovators to be able to build and design these technologies of tomorrow. Thank you. And Erin, I know having spoken with you uh, quite a bit, bit in the past, I know that you talked to so many great leaders across the board and, and different innovative organizations, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective on what you're seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. And thanks for really spearheading this conversation. It's an important one to have. And um, yeah, what we've what we've been seeing when I have my lens is looking at it sometimes from the perspective of an advisor to a lot of early stage technology companies uh, coming at it from a lean startup perspective and, you know, just kind of getting a, a landscape view of a lot of, of the emerging companies in Canada. And what we're seeing is um, a fair amount where where it's where Canada has been has been really good on the intellectual property side, um, but has left customer acquisition uh, a little bit as a lower priority. And what we're noticing as a trend is is uh, Canada starting to see okay, wait a minute, you know sometimes like our neighbors to the south in the U.S. or other countries. Uh, really focus on customer digital customer acquisition, and sometimes um, without a lot of intellectual property, they'll just grow these billion-dollar companies just on you know really focusing on that customer traction piece. And so that's a trend I can see happening in Canada that things are shifting to where uh, to stay competitive in the global market. Canadian companies have to shift and really focus on that digital customer acquisition. Jamie, you may have something to add to that, but also I wanted to just to ask specifically how Kojiko Pier 1 is evolving and preparing um, to respond to some of these trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. I think because it's so inherent in our DNA, if you go back to um, Pier 1 hosting, uh, which was Canadian, uh, founded in Vancouver and uh, really, really kind of created that, that peer to peer network and that, that explosion of, um, of supporting high demand, uh, high connectivity demand industries. 
such as gaming. Um, so it's, an, it's kind of already pre-built into our DNA. And then as Peer One merged with Kojiko Data Solutions and we became Kojiko Peer One, the DNA didn't go anywhere. So we're, we're always looking at how do we work with emerging industries. We were very early in partnering um, with some great AI companies uh, like Element AI in Montreal, um, where, where these the, the new companies that know from an early stage that they want to go global, we're one of those companies where we're Canadian, but we can take them global because that's how that's how our infrastructure is built out. Uh, and we think that's a great value proposition for these emerging industries. So uh, as I say, I think it's already inherent in our DNA. We we do it every day. We're always looking for the for the new the new industries that are that are starting up. And, and we uh, we're very fortunate that uh, we tend to be in in the mix in each, in each of them. And we partner closely with the hubs and incubators across the country uh, to keep to keep fresh with what's coming. I would just add to that that, you know, um, you know, iExpo Technology made a, a big decision earlier this year that in order for us to be successful, that we couldn't just focus on Canadian and U.S. markets, that uh, we started an office in Shanghai in February. And so, um, you know, now we have an opportunity to launch, you know, our solutions and our, our software um, in truly global markets and really hedge our bets. Um, and so really, uh, I think one of the elements, as is, is Aaron had talked about, is in order for Canadian companies to really scale and grow, you have to look beyond uh, Canada um, and, and into other markets. So, yeah, so it's great to ensure that you have vendors that have infrastructure that can help you do that as well. Right. Angela, what about e-structure? How are you? Yes, so um, we are also a 100% Canadian company. Uh, but we do recognize that we need to help our customers go global. Uh, and we're enabling that by uh, several uh, strategic partnerships and try to bring um, that connectivity between uh, local, um, facilities to facilities in Europe and Asia and direct connect by all the, to all the major clouds, to uh, all the major peering points so that we make sure that our customers grow and we're there to support them. And Erin, I feel like you're you're um, supporting a lot of organizations and leaders in these types of initiatives. Yeah, one way that we're actually focusing on um, how to how to uh, resource and and put capital towards this this trend that we're seeing is we're actually launching. Uh, it's this kind of a good timing here. Is we're actually launching a new division. Uh, that will really be uh, entirely focused on rapid customer acquisition. It's a methodology that we've um, partnered with uh, another company and they've done some tremendous things. And so this is where we're, we're starting this whole uh, venture right now to really get this um, very agile methodology out to companies. Uh, it's basically bringing kind of an agile <clears throat> engineering perspective into uh, a very aggressive marketing approach that's that uh, keeps a low cost and able to test rapidly to to get the market traction that you need so it's an exciting time for our company that's how we're shifting amazing and I don't know um, Vivian or anyone if you had anything else you wanted to add um, before we sort of shift the conversation a little bit I think the one thing um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention is is the the trend to more uh, cloud and and how we're now supporting more more of a, a multi cloud strategy where our customers they still sometimes want to be in one of our data centers or using our managed hosting or private cloud but we're also seeing um, more of a desire to look at how what workloads can they put into the the public clouds and so really partnering with them um to go on that journey and to include that that cloud conversation end to end as part of how we look at their at their workloads and having the the expertise in-house to to have those conversations so that it's never a one size fits all um when we when we think about how our customers need to scale and manage those workloads by geography, by load, by uh, connectivity requirements, latency requirements, so it's uh, 
it's it's a it's a very nice time to have, be able to have that full hybrid conversation and and including that that cloud dialogue. I feel like Angela at East Structure, you're thinking about a lot of similar things to that, aren't you? I think it was something very similar, and uh, yeah, I think it's important that we recognize that as the world is going through this digital transformation, we also need to build our organization to be able to adapt and make sure that we're high performing and then we act in an agile way to be able to keep up with the customer demands. Um, uh, and I know what is structure we do enable, this is how we function. We enable a lot of knowledge sharing. Um, it's a very open uh, um, organization. We're encouraged to take training regularly to make sure that we stay ahead of the curve, that we know what the trends are that they're coming to be able to have that meaningful, meaningful conversation with our customers and truly bring that value add. Yeah, Angela, you're on to a fantastic point. And the the culture of the company, the level of employee engagement, the ability for them to really feel creative and empowered is so critical to be able to take advantage of what we're seeing in the Canadian market. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm happy to see that uh, that's shifting away from the hierarchical organization and more towards like a team, a network. Absolutely. You know, that's a great segue into the next part of this conversation. And, you know, when we talked about setting up this panel and bringing all of you together, first of all, I'm so honored to have you all here. And it, it uh, just strengthens all of us to have, you know, to be able to fill a panel with such, you know, leaders and um, with with great thoughts and and great examples of work that's that's being done in the industry you know we wanted to create a panel of women across canada uh, women female leaders across canada but by in doing that we didn't want to just focus on diversity we wanted to start the panel with no let's actually talk about what's happening and and you know your unique perspectives on the marketplace um but now we do want to highlight a bit of you know, what is it? How are organizations um, responding to the need for diversity and how are opportunities uh, being raised and elevated for female leaders to, to really rise and, and what are the opportunities for them in the tech and telecom industry? And so I just wanted to sort of segue into that part of the conversation. And and Erin, you might be a good one for us to start with um, because of a lot of the work that I know that you're actively involved in right now. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, sure. Um, I can, and I should say that our, so the company, um, our team is Purpose Five, and we are a women-led organization. And I don't say a woman-led organization, but a women-led organization, meaning um, we try to make sure that our uh, over 50% of our technical team and our executive team is women. We're we're a small company, so it's it's easier to do at this stage, but. Um, but that's the you know part of the DNA that's that's a part of our company that we'll continue to grow with. Uh, but but inside of that, um, we actually incorporate uh, inclusive design and and behavioral design into we into the software we build, into the data driven websites we build. Uh, it's a really interesting lens to come at. Um, also in the digital marketing campaigns that we do. So we kind of bring that, um, so inclusivity is a whole uh, term that's being used. Sometimes people use that uh, uh, alongside accessibility, uh, but it, it's even, it's bigger than that. It's actually understanding um, brain types and which which aren't exclusive to, that don't go down gender lines every time, but um, but there are, there is some uh, fair amount of research on that, that for instance, uh, most, uh, most, I don't have to tell you guys, most tech companies are you know, 90% men, most software, most websites are built um, you know, typically with a, a certain brain type and it happens to be, there's a lot of men in that, in that industry and that's who's building the software and building the websites. Well, turns out that works really well for about 50% of uh, men's brains and about 25% of women's brains. Uh, what that means is uh, the other 50% of men find uh, most software and websites uh, not intuitive 
whereas 50% of men do find them intuitive. And But on the flip side, 75% of women find uh, most websites and software uh, not intuitive for them because it actually wasn't built for their brain type with in mind. So the difference of inclusive design is actually including more brain types in the mix as you build out software, as you build out websites, as you build out those communication and digital campaigns. What's important about that is 85% of all purchases online are made by women. So can you imagine trying to get reach 85% of all purchases and leaving out 75% of them and, and the interesting psychology um, that, that we've discovered with uh, men and women in, in, in this is broad strokes, I realize I don't want to get in too much hot water here, but broad strokes is, is that when a, uh, typically when a, a man approaches a software or website and finds it uh, that is not intuitive, they, they will push that away and say, well, that's, that software has a problem or that website is a bad website. Whereas on the other hand, a lot of women, um, with the 75% uh, of women, they would say, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just not very good at technology. I'm not very good at computers. Like they can't understand how to use software or, or navigate a website intuitively. So they step away from technology versus saying, no, no, that isn't built for me. And I need to go build something that actually works for me. So that's a huge difference and, and kind of the approach of um it's where i i really became a huge advocate and and uh and helped launch uh, victoria ladies learning code which is now canada learning code um and that was a huge effort to really help that shift in in mentality and transformation of of having women come out of being just consumers of technology and actually become creators of technology so that's a that's a big effort um, that I was on for a while. And now I've kind of shifted that lens to work um, what I call deeper in the funnel. So that was kind of top of funnel for beginner friendly technology. And now I'm working um, really uh, focused and, and even with Vivian, thank goodness, on some really neat projects, which is more for senior level um, women in technology. So we're looking at how can we best support these women leaders that are already running or managing really large enterprises um, or their founders or CEOs of, of um, small to mid-sized companies and what do they need there? So we're, we're actually launching this, this um, big event called Flip the Switch, which is a, a women in tech mastermind that's coming up at the end of this month. So uh, it's pretty exciting. We're bringing in you know, some of the best speakers in the world to come in and help these women and mastermind their companies over a weekend. So, uh, but there's lots of opportunities going on. There's so many diversity initiatives right now across Canada. It's really exciting to see. And it's exciting to see the government of Canada really invest in diversity initiatives right now. That's a shift we're seeing too. It's so it's so interesting to hear you talk about all this, Erin. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like we could have a whole hour just <laughs> just hearing about all of this and your your perspective. And I know you've been so involved in in a lot of it. Um, and um, and Vivian, did you want to talk about how you guys have sort of maybe that's a good segue into into what you two have worked together on? Yeah, I think, you know, it's so interesting, like, you know, for me, it's been a journey about how do I, how do I give back and how do I contribute, you know, to supporting women, uh, to pr providing women with platforms, um, both women leaders and those aspiring to be. And it's been an interesting journey. Just this year, I uh, signed up as a casual volunteer uh, to help organize a business symposium for the largest computer visioning uh, graphics conference. Um, and I ended up running the conference because the first draft of the agenda um, had no diversity whatsoever. And so I, you know, subtly put back in front uh, a new agenda uh, and it had um, a range of different speakers. Um, but what was really interesting for me in that journey was um, I found that there are still some systemic uh, supports that are needed for 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 women and um, to be able to have the platform to speak to be able to have the platform to speak to present their points of view um, you know 
if I had just wanted to finish the agenda, it would have been really easy because there are a lot of amazing uh, male speakers out there and, and a lot of them are raising their hands saying, I want a spot. And so my sort of insight was, you know, we need to encourage women to raise their hands to say, yes, I want to take a spot. I want to speak. I have things that I want to share. And two is to encourage those. Uh, we do need to provide a little bit more support, a little bit more of a nudge. Uh, to folks to say, you know what, we really would value your opinion in this in this platform, and um, and so we had a 50/50, you know, very diverse folks from different countries, um, you know, gender parity in in at the event, and what that enabled was that there were different points of inspiration for different people. Um, not everyone liked the same thing, but. As a result of diversity, you created a lot more creative creativity in the the conversation, um, and th there was something that um, the the audience in its entirety um, could find inspiring in different ways. And so, um, diversity is critical because if we don't have it, we don't innovate, we don't stay creative, and we we stay with groupthink. And um, I think in an innovation economy, that's the the death of it. So I think it makes business sense. And Angela, I have the honor of working with you almost every day, and uh, you're such a great example of a, a female leader who just really gets in and takes charge and and knows what needs to be done. So I, I'd love to hear your perspective on. Yeah. on um, so I think um, leaving aside the the so many well-researched studies that say that gender equality and at uh, you know leadership level, executive level is linked to higher profits in the company. I think what we've done at eStructure, and we're a fairly young company, um, we recognize that having a diverse team um, brings such a tremendous value. Uh, I mean, you have a variety of points of view and, and, and backgrounds and experience that you can draw on. And I'm, I'm very um, lucky to be working in an environment that's so inclusive, where we have, um, I think, almost half of director level um, positions are, are female uh, and that's just we're just moving in that direction it's, it's a very um, it's a very nice place to work in as a woman and to feel included and to feel like you're at the same uh, level um, and something that I wanted to point out um, it's the trend that as the technology evolves we can see this rising demand for for um, employees in the stem related uh, fields and Half of the uh, workforce that, that that will be possible for that is women, and that's not something we're about to, to ignore, right? True. Good point. Good point. Jamie, how about at Kojiko Pier One? We're uh, we're in a really unique spot with respect to the tech industry. When I joined, I we have three general managers globally. And uh, I joined as the leader of Canada and Asia Pacific and became the third woman. So we have a female GM for EMEA, female GM for US Latin America, and then myself for Canada uh, um, and APAC. And then two months ago, we actually announced our new global CEO uh, is, a, is a female. So we uh, were really lucky in that our senior leadership team just organically has diversity. Um, and then, uh, we're working, we still need to work through the through the middle. We don't have full diversity um, top to bottom, but uh, but we're lucky in that we, we have a great mix of creativity and different types of thinking when we get together as an executive leadership team. Um, and then myself as a mother of two daughters, my daughters are eight and 10, both have already been in coding clubs at school. Um, so just to see how um, in Canada, we're so quickly embracing that STEM conversation uh, with our children and women and little girls are just as included as, as boys in, um, in having that just part of their vernacular and part of, um, of what they're learning and what they're focusing on. I think that's going to make a huge difference as we uh, as we look forward over the next 10 to 20 years on uh, what our our technology workforce will look like if we just keep doing what we're what we're doing, especially in the early years. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Jamie, as well in the education. Um, opportunities even for my own children and, and young people starting out in their careers. 
Um, and I know that we've chatted before in the past, Jamie, about uh, just how a, a culture within an organization breeds the growth and breeds the opportunity almost. It's, it's, um, it becomes just kind of inherent in the organization. And actually that's what I'm hearing from all of you, really. Um, and did anyone else have any closing comments they wanted to make before we wrap things up? Any final words of inspiration anyone wants to leave us with? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Oh, this is an exciting, I mean, just to hear everyone check in, I'm hearing, you know, coast to coast here of all these different companies and did, wow, I mean, how remarkable that, that we are in, uh, we are very fortunate to be in the time that we're in and the opportunities that are in front of us right now. Um, whenever I have the opportunity to speak with younger women who are, are considering a career in tech, I always tell them, leap in. There's so much opportunity and possibility. You cannot go wrong. I, I, t I even say things like, you, you know, write your own ticket. Like you get to say how your career goes. You get to say what you create and bring to the world. And technology could not be a, a more opportune place to, to play in. Beautifully spoken. Thank you, Erin. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all again. Um, so much for joining us today. It really is inspirational, I, not just to me, but to I'm sure all of the people who are tuned in and who will watch this uh, down the road uh, on demand. So thank you, Angela, Adam, Jamie Leverton, uh, Vivian Chen, and Aaron Athene. And this wraps up our latest virtual CEO roundtable. Come meet us in person. Join us May 14th and 15th at Telecom Exchange in New York. You can find out more at thetelecomexchange.com. To feature your thought leader here next time on our monthly virtual CEO roundtables, email us at pr@jsa.net. Thank you so much for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom. Until next time, thanks so much for joining. <laughs>